uh, make sure we'll probably have a word of prayer for him next week before he finally goes. All right, I want to just give you one verse of Scripture, and I'm going to have Brother Mitch pray for us, and then we're going to get started. Romans chapter number 13, look if you will please in verse number uh, 12, we'll pick it up 11, and that knowing the time is now, uh, it is now, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. When do you normally sleep if you're not on shift work? Nighttime. nighttime. For now is salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of what? Darkness. And put on the... All right, Brother Mitch, you pray. Would you please ask the Lord to help us out? <coughs> given us to have us here, Lord, we're thankful for the future, and what he gave us this morning, Lord God, just dug down deep, Lord, and thankful for an opportunity to come to your altar and put everything on you. I ask, Lord, that uh, right now you open up our heart and our ears, my mind, Lord God, to absorb whatever you've given the preacher to give us, Lord God. Amen. Ask that you breathe on it, breathe on him, Lord God, and Lord to man. Uh, I pray that there's no distractions tonight, Lord God. I pray that we have uh, our ears open to hear. Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can have a seat. Now, you know that the Holy Spirit is likened unto light. And you know that the Bible teaches you over in 1 John where he tells you that uh, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if you finish that passage out there in Romans chapter 13, notice what he says. He's going to make a, a, a comparison here for you to grab a hold of. Verse 13, let us walk honest, honestly when? As in the what? Not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness and strife and envying. Now before he says put on the Lord Jesus Christ, who we know happens to be representative by light there. But I want you to notice he says walk honestly as in the day. And then he lists some things that go on at nighttime. So he's trying to give you an idea that when it comes to putting on this armor of light, people can tell when you're walking in the light. If God is light, the Bible tells you in 1 John, he said walk in the light as he is in the light and you have fellowship one with the other. Well, the antithesis of that would be, the opposite of that would simply be, if I'm walking in darkness, I can't say I'm walking in the light and I'm walking in darkness and saying I'm in the light. It means I'm not walking in the light. So when he says to put on the armor of light, it's like when Moses went up there and he spent some time with the Lord. And in his time with the Lord up there, when Moses came down, the Bible said that he wist not that his face shone. And he had to put a veil across that. People can tell if you're walking in the light or not. Your Bible is like an unto a light. The Bible says the light the, that your Bible uh, is like a flashlight. He says it's a light to your feet and a lamp to your path. Lamp to your feet, a light to your path. No, light to your path, a lamp to your... Have I got that right? The Word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my... Lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All right, so what that thing means is, is that that is intended to give you light on things. If I'm going to put on the armor of light, it's synonymous with being in fellowship with God because He's light. It's, it's synonymous with being in the Bible. And if I'm going to put that on, then I have to know what the Bible says so I'll know what I'm supposed to be properly clothed in. Now, I'll give you something to think about, and I can't prove it 100%, but it seems to or stands to reason that way. It looks like an Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're most likely clothed in light. You see pictures that are made on a regular thing. They have this big uh, glowing thing behind the Lord where he's surrounded by light, a big aura of light and things. I think that the lights went out more than in Georgia. I think the lights went out in the Garden of Eden when Eve took that fruit out there. And when she partook of that fruit, I think the lights went out. And I think that if the lights hadn't have been out, she wouldn't have known she was naked because why? She was covered with light. I think that she, uh, the Lord said that he was the light of the world and he came in to bring the light to us. Well, the thing that happens is, is when you get out of fellowship with the Lord, you lose your light. <clears throat> Excuse me. You lose while people see you, but you also lose the direction that you're going in. Now think about it. When you're out of fellowship with the Lord, like we talked about this morning, when you're out of fellowship with the Lord, you lose direction, don't you? 
Don't you lose the ability to be able to know whether or not you're for sure where you're going, where you're supposed to go when you're going. I remember being out in the woods one time and my flashlight went out and I was too stupid and too prideful to go back to the truck and get another flashlight or to get extra batteries. I got about halfway down that trail and all of a sudden the light went out and I couldn't get it to come back on for nothing. Well, I had a choice either to keep going and try to find myself the best I could or to turn around and go back to the truck or to holler help and then you weren't going to see any deer after that anyway. And I don't know about you, but the, you know, in a swamp at nighttime at four o'clock in the morning before the sun comes up, um, little ghoulie monsters hanging out in the trees and stuff like that. It helps to have a light to shine on them, you know, when you're, when you're seeing them and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Well, I was a little bit spooked out and that kind of thing. I figured I could figure my way around. So I'm stumbling around out in the woods and so on and so forth. And finally, Michael hollers from up there where he's at in his stand. And he said, would you get out from underneath my stand? <laughs> And I said, I, I, I thought I was going to my stand. He said, you've been walking around in circles under my stand for 20 minutes. Would you get out of here? What is your problem? He said, and I said, I ain't got any light. Now, it's a silly illustration to show you that, I mean, that guy could go out. You could set him out like a beagle on a blood trail at the middle of the night with no flashlight or anything. I use things. My, my path to my tree stand in those days looked like a landing strip, man. You thought you were coming into LaGuardia and Airline. I had little tacks with, uh, with reflectors on them, and you could shine that thing. There'd be one every 10 feet, man. I mean, you look down through there, and it's like, my goodness, man, it's lit up that way. He might have one, tree, one tack on the tree where he's going and no other tack. You couldn't find it with anything. Well, the point I'm making to you is this, ladies and gentlemen, when you get out of fellowship with the Lord and you lose the armor of light, you lose a whole lot more than just direction. You lose the ability to have discernment. You lose the ability to know if the next step you're about to take is going to put you in a gator hole and you're fixing to go down up to your neck. You lose the ability to determine if I'm in the right direction. Is the next step going to be into a bear trap? You lose the ability to see that pathway clearly anymore. It gets clouded and then before long the light goes out. It's like having smudged windows. That, uh, like having a, a lantern. You remember the old uh, Coleman lanterns? How many of you remember those? You know, if you burn that wick a little bit too high, you know what happens to it? It burns a little heavy and it causes a lot of smoke. And then before long, the inside of the glass is smudged up and that thing can be burned. Now, listen, man, you hadn't lived until you've been out there and you pump that thing up and you get that thing going. And then all of a sudden you like that mantle and it'll start humming. It'll sound like a little roar, like a little hair dryer going. And you hang that thing up, man, I'm going to tell you what, it'll light up a 10 foot circle. Those things were the greatest things since sliced bread and carrying around a flat flashlight in your mouth and trying to figure out this and hook that up. You pump that thing up, man, and get it hung up there. But you know what can happen? If the windows, if the glass on the inside of that thing gets dirty, it loses its effectiveness. It can't help anybody else. You say, what? Well, we know it's burning. You can hear it. And you can see it, but you can look right at it. When that thing is working like it's supposed to, you can't stare at it very long. Burn your eyes out of your head. But you know what most people do? They take the lantern down, they clean the glass on the outside and light it back up. And then they're like, well, how come it's still dark? Because the problem's on the inside. Oftentimes back in the old days when you work at a gas station and things like that, this is back in the days where uh, gasoline was less than 50 cents a gallon, 35 cents a gallon, 45 cents a gallon, 50 cents a gallon, and made about a dollar and a quarter an hour. I started at a dollar an hour. I got a quarter raise after I'd been there for about two months. I thought that was the biggest thing that I've ever seen in my, a whole quarter that I got. I was 15, 14, maybe 15. And they'd pull up in there and the boss man would have you come out and when they get $5 worth of gas, well, it'll just about fill up their gas tank. Somebody asked for $5, they're a big spender. And so they come in and want $5 worth of gas. Well, with that $5 worth of gas came, check their tires. We had a little tire gauge. You didn't have the stuff where you have the little thing that dings at you and you set the thing on it. You had to put a tire gauge on it and the compressor would come on and you press it and then back it off and then put it on there. And then you had to check uh, their, their oil and transmission fluid and that kind of deal. And then you had to clean the windshield. Can't tell you how many times you clean the windshield and clean the windshield and the person inside saying, hey, hey, you missed a spot. You missed a spot. And you're thinking, what do you expect for $5, man? Give me a break. I'm a kid out here and I'm trying to, those squeegees, you had to wet the windshield and then you had to wipe the windshield off like that. Well, you wind up finding out that the problem's not the outside, the bugs and stuff like that. Yes. Problem's on the inside. When you lose your light, you know what you don't realize? You start realizing you think everything's on the outside. Problem's on the inside. 
That passage says over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, it'll be maybe 4. It's down at the bottom of the right-hand page there. But you know what he says? He said, you're not children of the night. You're children of the day. So walk as children of the day. In other words, if you're recognized as a child of the daylight, your face ought to be shining in the sense that they can tell you've been with the Lord. If you've been with the Lord and you've been in your Bible, they can tell by what you do, where you go, and how you act, whether or not it's had an impact on you. I had a talk this afternoon with a young lady and her brother, and they came up from Orlando to deal with a couple of things there. And I sat there and I explained a couple of things. And I said, listen, this thing about Christianity, it is not something that you do. She comes from a different culture. I said, it's not something you do where you have these order of things that you do. It's what you are. It every affects everything, all your decisions, everything that you do. But if you're flying blindly, you got some serious trouble. Not too long ago, they had these kids that were down. It got to be a big thing for a while. And they had these little laser light deals. They're green and uh, red, different colors. You used to use them to point with and stuff. And uh, all our guys, way back a bajillion years ago, they had lasers on their uh, sniper rifles and all that and on their ARs. And we used to call it dotting them or painting them. And when them little buttons are in there bouncing around on your chest, you know that wherever that dot is, that bullet's going to go. That's the way that thing is set up. Well, they got these little laser things, and they were clowning around. When planes would fly over, they're shining the plane up there, and they're hitting it, and that laser light has an ability to carry further, and it was blinding the pilots. And so they threatened them with the violation of a federal law because they were shining the light and the pilot then winds up flying blind. He can't see the instruments. He can't see anything. That stuff's damaging. If you have one of those things, you know what it tells you in the instructions? Don't look at it. Yeah. Well, folks, that Bible is given to you to make a light to your feet and a lamp to your path. That means it's supposed to be pointed down here so you know where to walk. It's not used to shine on you and it's not used to blind other people with. If you truly are walking in the light and have on the armor light, people know that you've been with the Lord. <clears throat> they can tell. Have you ever been talking to somebody sometime and you're just having, you're not maybe intentionally going to hammer them with a witness or something or tell them they're going to go to hell in a big hurry or whatever, but all of a sudden stuff starts coming to you and stuff starts coming to you and stuff starts coming to you and you're clicking off scripture and you're thinking, man, I didn't even know I knew all that kind of stuff. You say, what is that? It comes from walking in the light. You know, what happened with Adam and Eve is, I believe that that light went out over there. I believe when they did that, that they lost their light. I believe they lost their covering. I think the covering that they lost there was a covering that prevented the other people from being able to see things that only God should see. And uh, it'll cause them to be uh, shameful because there's things you do in darkness. Why? Men love darkness rather than because their deeds are, you know, when the majority of crime happens. In darkness, at nighttime, it's correlated. So you know what he tells you? If you're going to put on the armor of light, then there's a couple of things that they should know of you. They should know that you're walking in the light. Are your decisions light or are they dark? How about your personality? Is it light or is it dark? They have a thing nowadays where they define individuals. They say, well, he's a very dark personality or his drawings or his writings are very dark or they have a shade of darkness to them. Have you ever listened to how you talk? Do you talk about the light of the world or do you talk about the prince of darkness? Do you know what he says all the way back? The law first mentioned over in the book of Genesis. He says about that light, the greater light to rule the day. You say, what is he talking to? Making a reference to, making a type picture out of God who's in charge of things. Now I'll ask you your testimony. Do you have on the armor of light? What does it do? It repels darkness. You've seen it when we do a candlelight service around here. I always try to make a big deal out of it. Y'all are probably wore out with it after 30 something years. When we have a candlelight service here, we have to turn off all the lights around here and turn off all the stuff that's up here and all that to make it as dark as we possibly can make it. And one candle just about pitches itself almost all the way back to the back. But everybody can see that one candle, whether the light makes it back there or not. You can see where the light is. Well, that's how intended when he says to clothe yourself with that armor. But you know what it does? It also allows you protection. You say what? It dispenses or dispels light. It pushes darkness back. Well, if you let your light so shine among men as the Lord tells you to, you know what? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how evil things don't approach you. 
You go out in the jungle and you go out, I don't know if you watch these survivor shows or anything. We used to watch them years and years ago. I don't know if they're even still on anymore. They used to dump out some people out there, not the ones that run around the, like the day they were born, but they go out there, they're playing Rambo and stuff like that. Some guy that was a how to survive thing, he'd jump out of a helicopter and then he'd be off in the jungle somewhere and all. <clears throat> good, you know, good, good television if you ain't got nothing else to do. And go out there and show you how to build a lean-to and how to get water out of a turnip and all that other kind of stuff, you know, and different things along those lines. But you know what they would do every time? Every time at nighttime, the first thing they try to do is get fire. You know why? Because animal, uh, wild animals don't want to come near the fire. Wild animals don't want to come near the fire. Do you see why it's important to be clothed with light? It keeps the wild animals off of you. The Apostle Paul, when he's referring to certain things that he went through, you know what he referred to? He referred to the wild beasts at Ephesus. He's not talking about wild bulls and tigers and lions. He's talking about men that are trying to destroy him. You put on the armor of life, you know what it'll do? It'll armor of light, you know what it'll do? It'll keep the wild animals off of you. You ever wonder why you get attacked so much? Maybe your wick's been uh, needing trimming. Maybe your windows inside the lantern need to be cleaned up. Maybe they're smudged up. Maybe you need to turn the wick up just a little bit. Maybe you need to spend more time with the light and walk in the light, and you don't have to worry so much about those things getting on you. Amen. The first thing I do whenever a ghoulie monster messes around or comes around, I don't care if you believe in it or not, they're real to me and say it doesn't matter. It's like puppy love, ladies and gentlemen. It may not be real, but it's real to the puppy. <laughs> And when them things come messing around with me in the middle of the night and that kind of, I'm not talking about nightmares and stuff I've been and seen and all that. I'm talking about things that are, there's something in there that I know shouldn't be in there. Yeah. Say, well, it's a figment of your imagination. Okay, scaring the fire out of me. You know the first thing I do besides plead the blood? As soon as I can, I find a light switch. Now, why would you do that? It just seems like a stupid thing. I don't know. You say, well, don't turn it on. You'll be able to see what it is that's getting you. <laughs> yeah, but when you turn it on, they dissipate. Yeah. You say, what do you do? I sleep with the closet light on. She wake up in the morning and say, they come by last night. And I say, how'd you know that? She said, well, the light's still on. Uh, it's not Motel 6. You know, I'll leave the light on for you. It's that when those things come around, they don't like light. Now you have to, you, you think your preacher has gone off the deep end and you think he's full of prunes and that kind of stuff. When I tell you all these dark shows and all these murder shows and all these shows that involve witchcraft, I ain't talking about just Harry Potter stuff and that, that's kid stuff, man. I don't believe in Harry Potter. You would watch all that witchcraft and all that foolishness. And I mean, what in business is a guy got doing? He must have stole the keys from his mama or somebody. No men ride brooms. That's women that ride brooms. <laughs> You need to be on the end of a broom and learn how to sweep. <laughs> but, 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 but listen to me, I'm, I'm not talking, they make, they make light of that like it's no big deal. Man, I don't even want to hear them words come across when they say those words when they're casting spells and stuff. I saw a commercial the other day. They got some girl out there and she's saying something to a light post and the light goes out when she says the magic voodoo words or whatever. I don't fool with that stuff. You say, what is it? It's toys of darkness. It's things you should have nothing to do with. You shouldn't mess around with it. Oh, I've got mostly grown people here tonight. I don't have a whole bunch of kids. I wouldn't let my kids watch that junk. You say, why? You talk about being woke up at three or four o'clock in the morning because they're having nightmares. You just opened up a gate and you let unclean things come up into your house with that stuff. All this playing Ouija board or go into the room and light a candle and look in the mirror and say things and I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you doing it. But I know you knotheads will go do that stuff. You're inviting things that are unclean in there. What are they? They're things of darkness. And you have no business fooling around with those things. Murder is not normal. It's not human for you to, to naturally have an affinity toward murder. If you have to investigate it because that's your job, that's fine. But that's a bloodlust that comes up in you. Like your stupid video games. Where you're killing things and blood's flying all over the creation and scantily clad individuals involved in that. And the whole thing, that whole thing is all carnal stuff. That's dark stuff. You don't have any business doing that stuff. I wouldn't recommend it if you ever had to go into a bar. And interesting, it's interesting to me, bars, bars, even in uh, hotels and things like that. They always turn the lights down. That's so you get drunk enough you can't tell who it is you're taking home. Do you wake up in the morning and go, 
oh my Lord, what happened to me, man? <laughs> you messed up. That's funny. Y'all are so, oh, I, I would never, you know, yeah. The more you put down, the better looking she gets. And the darker it is, the less you care. How, how in the world would he know anything about that? I was a policeman for 20 years. How do you think I know about it? I used to watch you people in the bars and sit there and say, oh boy. And he go in, man, I've never talked to her. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey, you want to have a drink? <laughs> well, I never would take her with me anywhere. Uh, where, where are you going? Oh, we're, we're going out to breakfast, you know. That's the same one. You're inebriated. You've lost your mind. The darkness overtook you. You can't even see, man. You got cataracts on your eyes or something. She's ugly as a mud fence, boy. And you're thinking, that's why she hangs out in places like that. She'll be glad to buy you the drinks. You say, why? It affects your vision. <laughs> I'm glad Miss Brenda's getting a kick out of this. Y'all aren't. You ever think about the things that are done in darkness? You know, when burglars come in, you know what happens at nighttime, ladies and gentlemen? He talks about things coming to the end. He talks about being in the nighttime. You know what happens at nighttime? That's when the ghoulie monsters come out. That's when the rats and the roaches come out. That's when the, uh, the, the, the people that are unmentionable come out. That's when the bad boys come out and stuff like that. Them kids that were riding around out here, and I won't mention names to you and all there, but there was four of them, and they're out there riding around at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know what they told each other? Let's go looking for boys. What kind of boys are you going to find at 2 o'clock in the morning? I'll tell you what kind, the wrong kind. To where some of you used to be at 2 o'clock in the morning. Just getting out of the last call, headed over to the Denny's or the famous Amos, sit around with a bunch of other drunks and eat eggs and grits and throw up in your plate, fill up the ER rooms and the jail houses, nighttime, that's when they're out. You see what happened to them. They ran through a red light and got hit and killed all four of them, graveyard dead. Good girls, clean girls, Christian girls and all that, riding around looking for boys at that time of the morning. That's the wrong kind of boys to be looking for. The boys you find that time of the morning, they're up to no good. They're up to no good. You see a guy walking around out here right now, screwdriver in his pocket, you don't think much of it. You see a guy walking around out there at two o'clock in the morning and he's walking by the door out there and he's got a screwdriver in his pocket. You know what you're thinking? He's going to try to break in. Yeah. Yeah. Just because of the what? No difference in geographical location, just the difference in the atmosphere. Yeah. You ever get around people and they're just kind of dark? Mm -hmm. They're just kind of dark all the time. They're just dark. They, got, they call dark humor. That, that ain't funny. That stuff's not funny at all. They draw things and talk about things that are dark, that are on the other side. You're connected with something. You're connected with the prince of darkness. The Lord's the exact opposite of that. Now, if you're going to put on the armor of light, it'll give you some protection against some things, but you have to make an effort to put it on. Well, preacher, how do I get it? You get it from reading your Bible. It'll make your face shine. The old preacher used to say this, it's better than any uh, uh, operation, you ha any facelift, he would call it, that you can get. Well, I say it's better than Botox. They didn't have much Botox around when he was around, but they would have facelifts and stuff. And they take a certain amount off your, chin off your neck and so you don't have a turkey neck. And then they pin it back here behind your ear so it pulls out the stu your, your stuff here in the cheeks. And then they get your crow's feet off of you. Listen, the best way to keep crow's feet off of your face is to keep the crows from jumping around on your face. What are you doing with a crow on your face anyway? You got crow's feet. What are you, the crow's supposed to have them attached to him. Why are they on your face? But the best way to do that kind of stuff like that, you know what he would say? He'd say, read the Bible. He said it'd give you a facelift. His testimony, his own testimony was after he got saved that he started reading the Bible. He read it through a couple of times in the first year. And the first time that he saw somebody, he said when he first got saved, he was 27 years of age and looked like he was at least 40 or 50. And he said he'd been reading that thing. And the guy came up to him and said, man, what's wrong with you? You look young. You say, what is it? Light of the body is the eye. You let the light of the word, God's word go in there. It'll do things for you. Now, I believe that stuff. 
I know when we were over there in a dark place over there in Romania, and I've told it before, it's a true story, and it's funny to hear the story. Brother Lent tells it better than I do, but he's dead now. But when we were over there in that place, that place is over there in uh, where Vlad the Impaler was. Uh, it's over there in the province of uh, Transylvania. That's the place where there's so much blood over the ground. He would hang people up on, uh, on, on uh, uh, stakes that are up in the ground. He would impale them, and then he would tie weights on them and pull them down while people were eating uh, uh, supper. And if you got turned off by that, then he'd hang you up on the pole. Vlad the Impaler. And we're over there in that place, in that place. That's where he got his name Count Dracula because of the amount of blood that he spilled. You can look all that stuff up. And uh, people would come across that mountain range there and he'd catch them all up there and he'd just slaughter them, just wholesale slaughter them. And I'm over there and we're talking about that stuff in class. That was part of my, one of the classes I had to teach. And then we're back there at uh, Lotzi's house and Lentz is over across the, on the other room over there and then I'm behind a hallway and in a room over here and we're hearing something in the house. And I don't know if you believe it's or not, it was something in the house. I mean, you could hear footsteps. Lent says, Peacock, is that you? P, call me. P, is that you? I said, no, it's not me, man. I don't think it's you. What are you doing? It ain't funny, man. Quit doing that. Th throwing your shoes down the hallway. On. It ain't me. I'm in the bed over here. I said, man, stop lying to me. He said, you stop lying to me. I said, well, go check out what it is. He said, you're the big bad policeman. You go check what it is. <laughs> We're like two little kids in there. We won't go see what the thing is. And I said, well, what is it? He goes, I don't know. And then all of a sudden I hear this. Like that. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm closing the windows. I said, they can come in through the windows. And he said, they can't come in anymore. I closed the windows. And I said, they can come through the windows, man. They're ghouly monsters. They're spirits. He said, shut up and go find out what it is. I wouldn't go back. We went back and forth like two little kids, man, like little school kids. <clears throat> they had these blankets over there, man, that came off of a goat's hind in up there and it smelled like it too. But I had that thing pulled up. You did it to keep the mosquitoes off of you. But you're also thinking as thick as it is, Jacqueline would have a hard time biting through it, you know. And so long story short goes, I didn't go to bed till that stinking light start cracking daylight over there that whole night. Something in that house, something crazy. And I went over the next morning and I went through the hallway and got out of the room there and came up there. And Lentz is laying over there on the bed. He looks like he's dead. He's got his uh, hands folded like this. And he's laying there like this. So I touched him on the foot and because he had been in Vietnam and stuff like that, you have to be careful how you wake him up, you know, and, and I woke him up, man, and he came flying up out of that kind of a thing and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I figured if that thing came through me, he'd have to bite me through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> and that's a true story. That is a dark place over there in that province over there. And you look down through that city boy and this smoke's rising up above that thing and they shut down most of the power in the place. And I mean, it's zero dark 30 in that thing like that. And you realize there's another entity there. I asked the old preacher about the thing and he said, a lot of bloodshed over there. Their blood cries out from the ground. And I said, well, you think there's anything to it? And he said, I don't know, you tell me. And I said, something was there. <laughs> he said, I understand that. Now you want to keep those things off of you? You got to walk in the light, have fellowship with him. How? You got to read the book that he gave you. Now, if you don't want to do that, then don't do that. You keep picking up all the dark stuff. You know what you do? You dispense and dispel the light. If you want to have the darkness be dispensed and dispelled from you, you got to walk and do the things of the light. It makes a difference what you do, but you have a choice to make. You say what? Choose the right things. Choose the things that bring light into your life. Quit fooling with all the dark stuff including everybody else's business where they're just always in the dumps. Unless you're trained in that stuff and unless God gave you that gift, dump it on somebody else. You're not built to handle that stuff all the time. That stuff's depressing. That's darkness. It'll wear you out. It'll weigh you down, man. And before long, you'll look like the bottom of a wet rock in the middle of 4th of July, boy. You'll be dark and black and down. And you'll look like, you ever see a homicide? Some of these guys have before. The homicide detectives, you ever get around them after they've been there a while? They look like, they're, they look like morticians. Here's a good one for you. You ever see the people that handle dead bodies all the time? Thank God for them. I'm glad somebody does that stuff. But you ever seen the, the people in the funeral homes? I mean, before long, you think you're looking at lurch or something, man. I mean, they come up there and, of course, they're measuring you when they're looking at you. You know, they're, 
getting a large or a medium or a jumbo or, you know, a piano case or something like that. They're, they're always measuring you. But they got this sort of a pasty, sort of a deadpan look about them. If you're in the funeral brands, we appreciate you. I mean, I know people are dying to get in there. I understand that, but I ain't dead yet. But you say, what happened? They're in the dark all the time. Your countenance should reflect Him. Amen. Well, does it? Well, I don't know. You know how they used to say, Miss so-and-so came in and boy, she sure could brighten the room. Well, I hate to tell you this, I've seen a lot of them that can sure darken one real fast too. I've seen them walk in and boy, you talk about suck the oxygen out of a room and ruin the, 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 meeting, the spirit of the meeting. They walk in with this dark spirit about them. You say, what do you have to do to dispel that preacher? You've got to put on the armor of light. You have to walk as children of the light. You have to do the things that God would have you to do. I'm not for the WWJD. I'm fixing to go to Galatians 5 here in a second, and I'm trying to hurry. But I'm not for the WWJD, and, you know, we want Jack Daniels or whatever it is you want it to be, or uh, we want Gene Dixon or whoever it might be, or what would Jesus do? Whatever you don't do is what he would do. But I am for you having that mindset. It's not a bad question to ask yourself. How about your business deals? Do you have to do them in a back room? Smoke filled? Do you have to, whatever your cho choice of, uh, of recreation is, do you have to do it in a dark room? Would you want to do whatever that recreation is when there's other people around? Would it bother you at all if the Lord walked in sat down there with you and said, pass the popcorn? I'm just asking. I don't know. I'm just saying. It makes a difference, doesn't it? And nothing that'll, that'll uh, bring you down any quicker than uh, dark, depressing music. You get a lot of the country western stuff that used to be out there and listen to it. So I don't know for sure. I'm not up to date. And so I use them. People say you need to up, update your, your illustrations. In order for me to update my illustrations, I got to get in the slop out there. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to tell you who's famous in rock and roll. Now, I'll go back to the days of Edgar Winter and, uh, and Ozzy Osbourne and all the, you know, bite the head off a bat and throw puppies out to the people. I got plenty of experience with all that. I don't need to upgrade it to whoever's out there now. But there's nothing quicker to get you in trouble than for somebody to be singing about all the things he lost when he met so-and-so. You just play the, backward, play the record back backwards and get it all back, I guess, you know. But you get to listen to that stuff and then it hits you at the wrong time and the next thing you know your head's in about a fifth of Jack Daniels and you're riding down the road thinking, you know, well, you know, I guess this isn't so bad and, you know, I lost everything and I lost my fishing pole and I lost my, my fishing tackle and I lost my suitcase and I lost my bed and I lost my furniture and I lost my dog and I lost my wife and I lost my kids and I, I sure do miss my dog, you know. You get this idea that if I came out with my dog and I came out unscathed, you're pretty dark, aren't you? You know what that stuff does? That'll drive you down into the depths of despair. You'll be in a hole you can't climb out of. You're quiet. You know I'm telling the truth. I've, I've watched them do it. And the next thing you know, say, well, that never happened to me. You won't if you walk in the light. But it don't take much walking in the darkness before you be ready to join them. All right, Galatians chapter number 5. I hope that helps you. I hope it makes some sense to you. If a man loves God, it'll be known of him. Is that right? All right. So if you get that godly glow about it, you know what will happen. You'd be surprised when you do that. People will avoid you. Did you know that? They, will avoid, they, they won't ask you. They won't uh, find out whether or not you hit them back on Facebook. They won't even be sending you something on Facebook. They already know the answer before they ever ask. Why don't I get asked at the party? Right? Well, maybe it's a good thing you didn't get asked at the party. Maybe you didn't get asked at the party for the right reasons. Yes. Maybe you don't want to get asked at the party. Maybe you wouldn't want to have to do what you have to do to be in the party. You say, well, you're a child of the light. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed that you're a child of the light. That's a good thing. But you don't have to walk around letting your little firefly light shine all the time to make everybody where it's shining on you. Just do what God tells you to do. You don't want to do it to protect you. It'll put you with the right crowd.
It'll draw the right things. You know what darkness doesn't do that light does do? Light draws uh, moths. Darkness doesn't draw anything. You know what you do? You just be a light for him. You'd be surprised. You'll work as a magnet. People will come to you. I'm for going out, knock on doors and all that. All that's changed since COVID. I'm for standing on the street corner. No problem at all. I'm for passing out tracts. But more than anything, I'm for your own personal testimony. The majority of people that come here, sure, there's a few people that watch us on the internet and things like that. But you know what it is? Your personal witness. There's a lot of difference standing out there on a the street corner and preaching. That's fine and dandy. But every one of you has the ability to be a personal witness on a daily basis. Do you let your light so shine before men or do you put it under a bushel basket? I mean, if you could start there, that's a great starting place. I mean, when you're doing a business deal, you don't have to tell them heaven and hell and all that kind of stuff. But can they tell you're walking in the light? Like, oh, I just knew that guy wasn't going to be that way. I mean, I've been in certain places with individuals. They'll look at the guy and say, you a preacher? I'm at a hospital one time and I was getting ready. I walk in there like that and this nurse came in there. She's a black lady and she came in and she's getting individual all suited up and stuff like that. She said, excuse me, sir, could I have your attention for just a moment? I just had on jeans and a, just a jacket. I mean, I wasn't inappropriately attired. I had on a coat. And she said, uh, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, my wife must have been talking to you. She said, no. She said, I think you're, aren't you a preacher? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, could you come with me? And she took me by the hand. And she walked me into the room and here she said, now this man right here, he is fixing to have surgery and it's a real serious surgery and he doesn't have anybody with him. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll agree with you in prayer. If you don't mind, he said he'll let you pray. Would you pray for him right now? Oh, ma'am, I can't do that. I mean, I don't know what religion he is and where he comes from and who he is. I said, shoot, yeah, man, I'll pray for him. And so we got down there and prayed and just the three of us there and prayed and he looked up and he said, thank you. I sure do appreciate that. And I said, you know, I'll be glad to visit with you. And the lady, she said, I know the Lord would provide for me the right man to come in and pray. Amen. And I said, well, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that very, very much. You say, what is that? I don't know. My light must have been on dim that day or something, but at least she picked up on it. Your life indicate anything at all that somebody can see? Would they be drawn to you in time of trouble? See, it's not just drawn to you to get out the gospel. They're struggling. They ever come to you and say, hey, could you help me? I, I, need, I need some help. I need some light. I need some direction. I don't know what to do. I'm exasperated. I'm at the end of my rope. They ever come that way? Or is your light under the bushel? They can't tell. And you'd be embarrassed if they were to ask you. You don't have to have all the answers, but you can pray. I'm big on that personal witness thing. I think you ought to be able to hand them a track or to witness to them. Not everybody. Do you ever pray about it? Do you ever pray? The Lord gives you an opportunity. Do you go through the door? Take a little time to cultivate them. Spend some time with them. You know what's amazing to me? I watch the kids around here. They have more sense than some of you folks do. I mean, no offense attended there, but you're going to probably get offended by it. But you know what they realize? They realize when they meet each other, it's going to take some time before they make a decision to get married. And then look back yonder at Lynn and Keith and all that kind of stuff. And they met and boy, I mean, you know, they're goo goo eyed and acting silly and goofy and all that other kind of stuff. And thank the Lord they had time to let the situation develop and get to know each other before they decided, you know what? And then he popped the question and they tied the knot. And you know what? The same thing applies when you're trying to get with, it's not about getting them in the boat as quick as you can get them in a boat. It's cultivate a relationship with them and bring them to church and take them out and get a hamburger. Spend some time with them. Don't be in such a hurry to put them on the stringer. Let them jump in the boat when they're ready. The Lord knows what it is they're dealing with. Your job is just to plant the seed anyway. You don't close the deal. That's ridiculous. That's Southern Baptist stuff. Just get out there and spend some time. Just be a witness. Just be a light in a dark place. God knows there's enough darkness around nowadays. People are ever torn every which way for Sunday nowadays. I mean, it is a soup sandwich out there in the world, and it is going fast. And I talked to this young lady. I said, surely you can tell and say the last, oh, three to five years how much the world has turned literally upside down and how things that are used to be wrong are now right and how things that were right were wrong. Surely you can see what's going on. She said, man, are you kidding? It's going so fast, she's not even saved. She said, how do you navigate in a situation like that? And I said, well, I have a pilot. And he's the one steering the ship. All I have to do is just get in the ship. And I said, once I get in the ship, I can't get out. 
You say, what are you doing? Just plowing, planting a little bit. Can't force it, got to wait. You say, what? Just walk every day in the light. That's all. Stay in fellowship with the Lord like we talked about this morning. Can I give you one more? What time's it getting to be? Yeah, 537. We got time. I gotta, I'll, I'll give you the rest of this on uh, um, uh, whatever today is. Wednesday. I'll give it to you on Wednesday. Look in Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians 5, verse number 16. Now we're talking about the right kind of clothing, the right kind of fellowship, and the, the right kind of things. Listen, you've got to learn if you're going to walk in the light, you're going to have to forget the mistakes you made in the darkness. Amen. I forgot to say that. When you made a mistake, when you sinned, you were in a dark place. You've got to forget dark places. Yes, sir. Don't replay the dark places over and over and over in your mind. That'll, that'll make you defeated so fast it'll make your head swim. There's nobody in here, including the elderly people when they were younger, that has lived a perfect life and has not had dark times in their life. Nobody. Amen. They just have learned enough not to broadcast that to everybody. But you have to learn not to dwell in those places. Turn the light on in there. Go inside your heart. Rip open that door. Kick it down. Kick it. Slap off the hinges, man. Uh, go get the battering ram and borrow it from the, the big boys and kick that door. Slap off and let the light come in there and burn that junk out of the inside and stop resonating down in that dark place. Stop it. It doesn't do you any good at all. It hasn't helped us in the past. You can't change it. It's gone. Turn the light on in there. Don't be afraid to go in that dark room. Every, every house has these little dark rooms. You go in there, you know, tater cellars and places like that. And nobody does. they got roots growing down out of the ceiling and things like that. And stuff coming in the roof. And black mold up in the corners. And there's a few taters over there on the rack. And some other uh, the canned vegetables and stuff. Dark, man. You turn the light on in that place. And it's dark. And it's moist. And it's wet. And it's dank. And it stinks. And you go in there and thinking, man, what am I doing that? Open the door up, man. Turn the light on in there. Paint the walls white. And stay out of that dark room. You know where you do? You would go in a dark room? You go in a dark room to, to develop negatives. You'll get it in a minute. To develop negatives. Don't you have enough negatives in life without you going through and developing and seeing a good picture of it? Well, stop going in the dark room. You know what kind of, by the way, the color of the light is when you're in the dark room when you're developing negatives? It's a red light. You know, back in my day, a bajillion years ago, you still had it here in Jacksonville. Some of you remember, very few of you though. Back in my day, you still had the equivalent of a red light district. You had stuff downtown that was something that shouldn't even be spoken of. I'm talking about movie theaters and peep shows and those kind of places. And back then you had a city council that at least had enough to recognize we need to get rid of that stuff. You had all kind of stuff going on down there, homosexuality and transvestites and all that, long before it was popular with all that kind of a deal. I'm talking about late 70s, 80s, that far back, 40 years ago that it was here. We had a thing called a vice squad in those days. And you spent time busting those places. Some of you look shocked. You say, no, not, not here. Oh, yeah. Here, absolutely. Those charges, you get up there and run those things through the court system, the docket to be full of people you catch down and doing that kind of crazy stuff. Right downtown, right down in the main business district. And people fill those places up and fill those places up and fill those places out. And San Juan and San Jose and Phillips Highway and all those kind of places. That's where it all started. Now they got rid of it. Of course, now you can pump it right in your living room. But that's back in the day where everybody didn't have access to that stuff. You say, what were they? I never went in there. Not one time did I ever go in there and they had the bright spotlights of halogens on. By the way, Brother Roger, I appreciate your place and all those lights. It's a lot easier to see up here. But at any rate, I bet that was scary being that up there. That's about 25 feet up there, man. I bet that was freaky for you. You don't like heights. But anyway, did you do that? Okay, well, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> I guess, it was scary. I guess it was scary for you. It's not a dark place, though. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It doesn't take much of that darkness before it rubs off on you. And then before long, you know what happens? You get comfortable in the dark places. You know what can happen to you? If we shut the lights off in here right now, if I have you look up at those lights and then look down and turn the lights off, you'll look out and you won't be able to see anything. But just give it a minute. 
that vitamin A will kick in and that retinol will kick in. You know what will begin to happen to you? <laughs> You'll be able to see in the dark. You know what can happen to you? You hang around in the dark long enough, you're able to see. Better to just walk in the light. Yes. Yes. They turn on that light at 2 o'clock in the morning, last call coming, man, it look like roaches running out of the kitchen <laughs> out of there in the afternoon. You go in to get a midnight snack and turn it on. <laughs> they're all scattering all over. People walking around, you know, and like, like <laughs> that's what happens to you. You get accustomed to the dark. You know what you say? Turn off the light. Turn off the light. Turn off the light. And then you get accustomed to that dark music. You get accustomed to those dark ways. You get accustomed to those dark people that are up carnal, walking as the world walks. All right, Galatians chapter number five. Give me um, maybe 10 minutes, okay? You can put a clock on me and see if we can do okay. All right, Galatians chapter number five. Now this is important for you. If only two through walk together except they be agreed, the principle is borne out in Galatians five. This I say, verse number 16, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So can we say walk in the light as he is in the light and we'll have fellowship one with the other? Would that resolve your problem with your flesh? Would that resolve the problem with you? Thank you, Brother Berkeley. It'll solve Brother Berkeley's problem. For the rest of you, we've got to read further. Brother Berkeley said, yep, that, Brother Berkey said, that'll work for me. Uh, yeah, that'll work for me. If I can walk in the light, yeah, walk in the spirit, I get it. I see the correlation. You see the correlation? It's the equivalent of the same thing. Now he goes on further to say this, the flesh lusts against the spirit, spirit against the flesh, and that ye are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things you are. But if you be led in the spirit, you're not under the law, or you're not under that law. You don't have to do what the flesh tells you to do if you walk in the Spirit. You say, why? The Spirit tells you something contrary to the flesh. The flesh says you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. And for human nature, it's natural for you to do whatever the flesh tells you to do. But he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you don't have to have it as a boss anymore. you got a choice now. Do you realize when you got saved, he gave you a choice? You don't have to obey your flesh. If your flesh is contrary to what the Spirit wants to do, you know what you now have the power to do? If you can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth you, you know what you now have the power to do? You don't have to do what your flesh wants to do. Before you got saved, you don't have a governor. Might call it self-discipline, might call it an inconvenient time, might call it an inconvenient place, but before you got saved, you generally went wrong with whatever the flesh said to do. That law commands man, Romans chapter number six. Hey, Romans six, I'm not saved, I gotta do whatever and yield my members to whatever my flesh or the devil wants to do. Whoever I yield, that I'm, I'm his instrument. But now that I'm in the spirit, I don't have to do that. Your flesh says, Touch that. The Spirit says, don't you dare. That's more than your conscience. And you say, my flesh says, but I want to touch that. And the Spirit says, but I don't want you to. And you say, well, I'm going to do what the Spirit said. I'm not under the law that said I have to touch the flesh, whatever it is I'm wanting to touch that I shouldn't touch. I don't have to obey the flesh anymore. Now, there's a real principle there that's there, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes on to putting this armor light on and committing on the whole armor of God and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and putting on the new man. All that requires effort for you to be able to do it. And then he gives you some things to check about there. And if you see yourself show up there, you know what you need to do? You should be able to work that list down and have less of those things in your life this year than you had in your life last year. The murderer and stuff like that, that should be no big deal for you. But what about the other things that are indicators that you're in the flesh? Let's just look at them real quick, just to give you an object lesson. He says this, the works of the flesh are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Uh, the context of all that, including uncleanness, has to do with sexual immorality. Not just uncleanness because you ate with unwashing hands and uncleanness because you ate out of a garbage can and uncleanness because you didn't take a bath and so on and so forth. You look at the things surrounding that word right there, you get pretty quickly, you get the idea. A lasciviousness is nothing but lustful, unbridled, uh, uh, uncontrolled desire on steroids. We used to charge them with a lewd and lascivious assault on a minor child. You say, what is that? Just unbridled, I don't care who it hurts or whatever I want to do. I'm just going to appease my flesh. That's an actual state statute that's there. It's still there today. What, what is that? That's uncontrolled appetite. God gave you those appetites. 
But everybody that has an appetite, he also gave you a governor. And you have to control those appetites. And he gives you parameters. For instance, when it comes to those things that are of a physical nature that I mentioned the other word for earlier, you didn't listen and you get the tape, but what that means is within the confines of marriage. The other things are out of bounds. If you're doing those things, you know what he said? You ain't walking in the Spirit. You're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Guess who's winning the battle in your life? And ladies and gentlemen and parents, you better pay attention because you used to not have to mention this stuff. But nowadays, man, kids that are 10 and 11 and 12 years of age because of video games and the onset of some of the stuff you let them play, they're seeing stuff and tripping their trigger at a younger age. Hey, boys, look up here. There ain't no time to be looking down at the rug right now. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, don't, don't be telling them that. And all that kind of stuff. That 11 year old boy sees some of that stuff. That trips his trigger at an early age. And you're a fool to let him do it. Amen. And you're a fool to let your girls play it because they get the idea in order to get the boy's attention. That's what they have to do. You say, oh, you're just old school and you don't understand where kids. Hey, listen, you're stupid if you think I don't know what I'm talking about. And you're crazy and you think, well, you just got to kind of catch up with the times. I don't want to catch up with your times. I don't want to be a kid and here I am nearly 70. I don't want to be a kid again. I don't want to relate to kids. I'm not a pervert. I'm not a weirdo. I'm not a creeper. I'm not trying to get on the kid's level. They know I'm an old man and I'm going to talk like an old man. This idea of trying to be 40 and relate to the kids, that's some kind of creepy stuff. That's pedophilia junk. You know, that's wrong. You're 40, act it. You're 40, dress like it. Don't dress like you're a stinking teenager. Well, I'm just trying to relate to the kids. You're acting like a punk is what you're doing. I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Well, don't you think you should relate? No, I don't. I'm an old man. That's weird. You ought to amen that. That stuff's weird, man. You're trying to relive your childhood or something like that? What, what is that? What, I, don't, I don't get that. And you've got to learn how to do all the, whatever the new bump is and whatever the things and all that kind of, give me a break, man. I'm, I'm still in the. <coughs> <coughs> oh, what, what, how come you feel like you have to do that to get their respect? You know what they do? They're like, that's embarrassing. You don't get their respect. They think you're acting like a juvenile. Don't, don't let them pull you down to that. Act like you're an adult. It's okay to be an adult. Well, they don't like me. Well, when they're paying your bills, then, you know, you can change your attitude. But until they are, who cares if they don't like you? Are you doing what's right to do? This country has completely lost its moral compass altogether. I mean, it is in the, it's in the garbage can. You go into schools now, they don't let the boys and the girls uh, hold hands or kiss, but they won't interrupt two queers. Your kids nowadays, you know what they do? They go to school and they deal with that. They have kids setting up other kids with people of the same sex. And your kids in this church know about it. Ask him, he'll tell you. You need you got your head in the sand. Because why? You're too busy trying to relate to them and play their stupid games with them. Hey, sir, why don't you teach them how to use a screwdriver and a socket wrench? And why don't you teach them how to use a saw and a hammer and teach them how to hunt and to fish and things like that instead of you relate to them because you can play some kind of war game with them? What is wrong with you? I guess it's frustrated ambition. I guess you never did that in your earlier life, and so you, you step out and you live in a fantasy world. Well, you live in a fantasy world is, uh, you know, Ren 10 10 or something, and then eventually you wonder why they're living in a fantasy world, and they're playing different kind of games that make them the bad guy, and they get so many points for killing police. Well, you play it right there with them. You say, no, I don't play it with them. You let them play it. When's the last time you went through your kids' games? When's the last time you went through your kids' telephone to see what apps are on there? You don't bother. You're afraid of what you'll find. I'm sleeping with my phone in my room. You must be staying at the Motel 6. You're not taking your phone to your room in my house. You know, preacher, you're old. You don't understand what it is to raise kids. Okay. If I, if, I, if I take their phone away from them, they'll have a meltdown. Once. <laughs> hey. 
I was going to get done with this in seven or eight minutes, but it's, it's kind of hanging up, man, you know. <laughs> All right, now notice your next group of the things that come in there. Let me just give you this, and I got about eight minutes till six o'clock. Notice what he says here. He says, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. Those all go together there. You say, what is idolatry? The worship of anything other than God, including work and reputation. Yes. What's witchcraft? It's more than just they use this word pharmacae and stuff like that. It's monkeying around with things that have to do with uh, the other world. It's not drugs. It's you messing around with things that have to do with the other world. Witches and warlocks and casting spells and horoscopes and all that other kind of stuff. That stuff's real. Yeah. Doing astral projections and different things like that. You've lost your mind. And then he goes on a little bit further than that and talks about, look at what's in there. Now, like I said, you need to work this list down. Well, preacher, so far, so good. Okay, how you doing on hatred? How's that one working out, on, uh, working out for you? How about emulations? You know what emulations are? It's striving to be like somebody else so bad that it becomes sinful. You're emulating them. You're copying them. Why? You want what they've got. So instead of being what God made you to be, you become somebody else. How are you doing on that one? A preacher, I'm not an adultery or fornicator and I'm not committing lasciviousness or any of that other kind of stuff. Okay, how about hatred and emulations? You ever emulate somebody? Somebody that you shouldn't be? I would like to see you emulate the Lord. Give you just a couple more. How about wrath? <laughs> how good are you with that one? How about strife? Is your life full of strife all the time? Everywhere you're around, there's always strife. Something's coming up. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says that strife is coming from your flesh. That's what he just told you. That didn't come from God. You can't make it look like it came from God. Strife. Variance. Isn't that one in there? That's always being at odds with whoever. Always find something wrong with something. No matter what it is, it's never right. There's a better way to do this and that and the other. Uh, there's uh, envy and wrath and uh, strife. Uh, let's see, emulations. There's another one in there, uh, seditions. Seditions, that's uh, a rebel. That's always breaking away from something. That's never fallen in line. That's, I've always got to have my way. It's always how I see it. It's always how I feel about it. It's always about me. Yeah, you're the center of the whole universe. Somebody would think you were Jesus if they didn't know any better. How are you doing on those right there? There's at least four of those five or six I just gave you right there that all of us could do some work on. You say, well, I'm not really a seditionist. Really? God gave you an order and you obeyed it? 1% hesitation is 100% rebellion. You sure you're not a seditionist? Emulations. Do you emulate Paul? Do you emulate Christ? Or do you emulate your favorite person in the world? How about your wrath? You know what he says over in Ephesians 4, and we'll get to this on Wednesday night. You know what he says in Ephesians 4? He says your, your uh, wrath and your strife, and your malice, and your bitterness, your intentional hurt of one another. See, that's far and beyond the adultery and fornication stuff. That's how you're treating each other. These are things you have to work on. You say, what do you do? Preacher, how can I overcome that? You just simply walk in the light. You don't focus on the dark things. You learn to walk in the light. You learn to put on the new man. You learn to put on the whole arm of God. You learn to put on Jesus Christ, as it says at the end of the passage there in Romans chapter 13. You learn to gird yourself with light. You learn to put on all those kinds of things. You say, what does it do? You focus on the positive things and negative things dissipate. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might take the things that we've mentioned.